hey, how's it going? So I'm crashing into things. So today, actually it's really bright out here. There we go. Funny how sunglasses work. So today we've got a number of things going on. I've been filming some stuff over the last few days, a few different random projects. Got over three hours of footage, so I think what we're gonna do is basically talk about the vans, and then also, I did get a new chair. There, I'm intentionally leaving out some information on that, but we're gonna adjust the seating on that, and there will be a lot more videos about that chair coming soon. But I think for today, we're just gonna do kind of a vlog style thing, trying to figure some stuff out, and yeah, keep it simple or whatever, right? Hopefully you enjoy. Well, it seems to be morning again. Uh, today is already shaping up into having to do a lot of stuff. Ugh, why are mornings so dumb? It takes forever to like get the brain online and actually do stuff. Anyways, so we have the new chair out at the warehouse. If you didn't see the live stream, um, we got a new Amy Systems R3 hybrid. And when I left there last night, I plugged it into a charger because I've got some of those smart switches so I can leave a chair plugged in overnight and then the next morning I can use my phone to turn it off. Well, for some reason, the warehouse is offline and I can't see any of the security cameras and I can't turn off the charger for that chair. So we're gonna have to drive out there. But there was another complication yesterday. Right as I was pulling into the warehouse before the live stream, I noticed the classic uh, metal on metal scraping noise of brakes on the blue van. Uh, seems to be coming from the back. I know they needed to be replaced. I had the front ones done last year. Anyway, so on the agenda for today right now, I'm trying to figure out what to do with the van situation. So I'm gonna drive by this one shop that has done all the work on this van. Uh, actually, when the previous owner had it, they did all the work on it as well, including an engine replacement at one point. But I'm gonna stop by there, see how much it's gonna cost to get the brakes done, get on the schedule for that. And then also, it needs front struts and some other things. I'm gonna figure out how much all that's gonna cost. I've been toying with the idea of selling it and also selling the green van and getting one vehicle that's larger and is reliable. So anyways, I think that's what we're gonna do. <laughs> do I admit that it's noon right now? <laughs> anyways. I'm gonna get, get myself put together, hop in the van, and go over to the shop and see what we can figure out. Then head over to the warehouse, and um, I kinda wanna play around with a new chair anyways, so yeah. Welcome to Friday. Let's uh, let's see, see how it plays out. <laughs> okay, I stopped by the auto shop. It's gonna be about well, somewhere between 650, somewhere in that range to get the rear brakes replaced on this. And they're booked up till like August 9th. They said they could squeeze me in then. Problem is this metal on metal with these brakes is bad. I thought maybe I could drive out to the warehouse, but um, can you hear it? And they're staying they're still grinding even after I let off the brakes, so I think I'm gonna try and drive the green van out to the warehouse. I've, yeah, see, they're still grinding. I have driven that thing out there a couple of times being really careful, it does still run, but I can't leave that chair plugged in for a week until I can get out there, so we'll see how this goes. Okay, we made it back to the bus. Um, the green van has the laundry cart and the generator in it. So I think I'm gonna put the generator in this van since I'm not gonna be driving this until I can get the brakes done in a week and a half. One of those not ideal situations. I, I really think I should sell both of these vans and just get something more reliable or larger or both. I don't even know. All right, let's see if we can get this thing to do something and drive somewhere. Oh, and also the uh, the bridge plate control struts have crapped out on this thing. As you can see, the bridge plate is not retracting. Uh, here. There we go. So that makes things interesting as well. Those gas struts there kind of pull that thing back up. Uh, 
I don't know. I'm wondering if I can buy some automotive ones that are about the right size and like cobble them on there somehow. They have heim joints on both ends. Uh, I don't know. If it's not one thing, it's like four things. Hello, tractor. Let's see what color of fumes come out the exhaust pipe on this. Okay, a little bit of smoke. That's typical modular engine stuff, I think. It sounds like it's running on at least seven and five eight cylinders, so that's something. As you can see, this van is kind of a storage unit. We have the laundry cart and the generator in there. There's also some plywood and other stuff that I wouldn't mind dropping off at the warehouse anyways, so um, I guess let's get some things unloaded. Holy crap, I fit them both in the blue van. Okay, sweet, that'll do. So this is one of those times where, well, see how these tires are basically brand new? About probably six months ago, when I was having some other problems with the blue van, I deemed that I needed a backup vehicle. And even though this hoopty does need an engine, it does run, but the tires on the front were showing belts. So <laughs> I wound up going down to the tire store uh, opened a line of credit, bought two new front tires for it, and a new battery, so at least I have a backup vehicle, even if it's not super reliable. Because, you know, living out here in the middle of nowhere, if one vehicle goes down and I don't have a way to drive, things get kind of sketchy, so... I'll explain more as to how this thing is still running here in a minute. Let's, uh, let's get on the road. Well, so far so good. Um, time for coffee, golden arches. Okay, let's see if this thing kept its coolant. Yeah, it looks like we're good. All right, cool. Um, let's go inside and I'm going to explain why it is that I'm driving this thing. Okay, so Dan, I thought your green van was broken and it needed an engine. How is it that you just drove it an hour and a half out here to your warehouse? Well, um, does still need an engine. I did something kind of dumb, but also maybe kind of not. <laughs> so this thing, if you hadn't heard, there's a previous video about this, I'll link that up above, but it had a manufacturing defect when it was built. The robots that basically move the heads over and put them on the engine when they're being built and whatnot, got out of calibration or something happened, but when the robots grabbed the heads to drag them over and put them on the engine, they got a score mark put in the metal from one of the dowel blocks that stick out of the engine block to align everything. So in that other video, I wound up using some of that glue in a bottle to fix it, and it actually worked for a while. That stuff started breaking down, I wound up getting the blue van, driving that thing around, whatever. Um, I figured, let's try something. We know the head gaskets worked for a while, so this is gonna make some of you that know anything about automotive repair and engine building start yelling at your screen. I may have retorqued the head bolts. <laughs> They're torqued to yield bolts. That's normally something you never do. So torque to yield bolts, they're basically stretchy, sort of. You put them into the torque spec and then depending on the application, you rotate them another 180 or 240 degrees to stretch the metal and make it into sort of a spring. Now that's a one-way trip. You can't reuse those things because the metal has stretched. I figured the thing was already hosed and at that point it was down on one and a half cylinders anyways. 
So I just went ahead and retorqued them all. <laughs> I'm not gonna say it worked, but it helped a little bit. I wouldn't want to drive this thing any long distances or at any speed or tow anything heavy, but for right now, it seems to be working. <laughs> um, so yeah, anyways, um, it's a backup vehicle for now because it's going to be about a week and a half before the other one can get into the shop to get the brakes replaced and all that stuff. Um, what are we doing here? Oh, that's right. We got to unplug this chair. So we've got the new Amy Ultrac R3 and I left this thing charging overnight. As you can see, the charger's green. So we'll, we'll unplug that. I, uh, I pulled the back cover off of it. I know it's dark in here, I gotta turn on the lights, but I pulled the back cover off and I've been adjusting the seating a little bit. Got the leg rests lowered down. Had to slide down the seat back a little bit. And I think today while I'm here, since it's Friday and we're at peak traffic rush hour, I got a few hours to kill. So I think what I'm gonna do is loosen up the back here and I'm gonna turn on the lights and we'll show all this, but I'm gonna slide the back forward a couple of inches because right now we've got a little bit too much space right here. So anyways, I'm gonna eat some food and finish moving some stuff in and out of that van. Then uh, we're gonna work on this thing. Oakley dokley, food has been consumed and coffee and such. It's not a billion degrees in here in the moment, so that's good. Let's look at this thing. So yesterday, I didn't really show it on camera, but I had to adjust the foot plates down just a little bit. And now if you notice, they kind of stick out a little bit in front of the seat pan. And also the seat pan sticks out a little bit from the cushion. So we need to basically shorten up this seat pan about yay much. And to do that, the easiest way is to slide the back of the chair forward. And as I recall, the seating system on this is fairly similar to the old chair I had before. So what we need to do basically is unfasten some of this hardware here, pull a couple of these bolts out, and I think this whole mechanism should slide forward. And in effect, that will shorten up our seat depth just a little bit. The chair is at a little bit of a tilt right now, but as you can see, our clearance here is, is pretty close. I like to keep the space between the leg rests and the front of any chair as minimal as possible, and this distance right here is good. So instead of trying to move the leg rests back, I think moving the seat back forward is gonna be the best way to deal with that. Because, well actually, you can't really shorten these seat pans. They are a fixed length, so, yeah, so we're just gonna pull that whole thing forward. As I recall, actually it was the old purple Amy Systems chair, which I think is still sitting over here. Yeah, so you can actually see here on this one, uh, we did the same thing. You can see how there's a little bit of seat pan sticking out here on the back, and basically just did the same thing. Slid the whole thing forward. So it looks like all we have to do is deal with these fasteners down here, and these ones over here on the side. And I think the whole thing should slide forward. Now this chair has, um, the seat will fold forward, but it does not have any sort of recline. The new one does, but if you see here, this, this plate doesn't hang out on the back there. And on the new one, this uh, actuator is cantilevered just a little bit. But if we look down here, we can see that it doesn't hang down below the seat pan. Boy, that's a lot of tilt, yo. Moving on to adjusting this backrest here. I think these screws go down into the frame. I can't find any nuts underneath there, and there's a big metal bar. So we're just gonna loosen up these rails just a little bit. These use sort of a T-nut arrangement that slides in the track. And then tentatively, we can loosen these and see what they feel like. I don't think there's nuts under there, but we should be able to tell. These appear to be loosening, which would tell me that there's no lock nuts underneath there. Let's take a look down inside these other holes and see if there's threads. Ah, yep. Here, I'll get a picture of my phone. You'll probably be able to see it in the photo, but uh, there are in fact threaded holes down underneath here. So we can move this thing forward. Wait, how far did we say? two inches. 
Uh, two is kind of a lot. We'll probably slide it forward one and then just take a look at it and see how it looks. Then go from there. Now you gotta be careful when you pull out stuff like this because the seat can try and tip and move around on you. We should be roughly held in place by the side rails, but there is still definitely a chance that this thing could try and tip and move on us. Okay, let's give it a wobble. Yeah, so our side rails are gonna hold it in. The whole thing moves a little bit, but since there's two points in this T-track, um, it's not gonna go anywhere, so. And go ahead and pull these out the rest of the way. Then we're gonna wanna pay attention to all this wiring here on the back. We've got the, the light harnesses and the main harness here. So as we slide this thing forward, um, just wanna make sure none of those move on us, or get pinched rather. So for this, usually you gotta kinda rock. I'm grabbing it, I'm grabbing it up here on the top and kinda rocking it back and then sort of pushing the bottom at the same time. There we go, you can see it sliding. And these wires here are pulling pretty tightly. Yeah, this one's pretty tight. Actually, it feels like there's a little bit of extra wiring right here. Uh, I'm gonna hop on the floor and see if we can extend these a little bit. Oh yeah, so we've got extra wire here. Let's basically cut one of those zip ties, then we can pull this out a little bit. And that gives us enough slack here to move this forward. And then we'll just use some new zip ties and reattach all that when we're done. And now we should be able to slide this forward a little bit more. There we go. Everything's looking fine with our wiring. So we need to, actually I think we went a little bit too far. There we go. You can see the holes right down there. Let's get these kind of lined up and get our screws back in here. Now these holes are kind of oblong shaped. So I'm gonna go in the back and make sure that our rear seating has not slid left or right at all. And everything looks fine. We'll get this other screw in here, or bolt or whatever it is. Now before we get these all nice and tight, I'm gonna kind of wiggle the seating a little bit just to make sure our T-bolts are not bound up over here. Everything's nice and flat. All right, that all looks good to go. Let's crank these down. Now it may look like I'm really reefing on these things, but remember, this is a stubby ratchet. You can only develop so much torque with this with your hands. Okay, I think that should take care of it. Let's grab our cushion. There we go. Now it's just touching the seat back and it's perfectly in line with the front here. There you can see the front is now in line with this. And our leg rest stick out a tiny bit, but that's okay. I think that should be fine. I do, however, need to get some side guards put on this thing. I use these lateral supports or whatever they're called. So I'm gonna have to get some more of these and get them put on this chair because I need to get some Velcro for that cushion too, but without those, I feel like I'm sliding out of the chair and stuff. So anyways, let's uh, put this thing back down to earth and hop in it, see how it feels. One other thing you have to watch out for when you're adjusting foot plates on a chair like this is the clearance of your front caster wheels on your foot plates. As you can tell, this chair has very large front casters. But if you notice here, we've got plenty of clearance. I dropped these down probably two inches or so. But yeah, just wanna double check that. I gave them my measurements for this chair and then they built it up and got it pretty close. The idea was just for them to get it in the general vicinity so that my adjustments would be fairly minimal once I got the thing. Oh, we also need to now adjust this mounting point for our arm support because you can see it's at a backwards angle so there's just uh two bolts down in there and t-slot track thing and just slide that forward a little bit um this thing seems to fit me pretty well let's get the f3 out of the way yeah there we go now the uh 
the backrest feels good and the distance from the backrest to my legs is good. I can just barely get my fingers underneath my leg here. The backs of my calves are just touching the, um, the leg rest like calf pads or whatever, but yeah, it feels great. Ah, a new chair. Well, just put a little over two miles on this chair and I'm not sore at all. I went on some of the roughest asphalt I could find and bumpiest bridges and whatnot and I think we're good. I was amazed by the speed bump. Hang on a minute. That speed bump was not nearly as bad as I thought. Yeah, let's hit that at four miles an hour. That's five miles an hour. It jars just a little bit, but it's not bad. Huh. Interesting. If I hit that at any speed in the bounder, for example, it will send me flying. So, um, Amy System Suspension FTW. Since I am driving the green van, I think I can fit this thing in the back and take it back with me because I want to run around on this thing some more. Which reminds me, I should probably grab the charger and bring it back with me. Um, yeah, sweet. Well, I'm going to load up and head back to the bus. One of the problems with reviewing power chairs is trying to objectively quantify their ride quality in a way that you can look at some numbers or information and be able to determine, determine words, this chair has better ride quality than this one, this one's way off the charts, this one's really good. I had an idea for a method to get this data a while back and that's by using a random cell phone. This is like an old iPhone 7. Smartphones have a lot of sensors inside them they have accelerometers and they can tell movement of the phone and the device on all the different axes and also detect g-force and things like that. So my thought was, take a phone like this and there's applications you can run that will give you raw sensor data and you can data log that and export it into graphs and things like that. So my thought was, get a mount, attach the phone to the side of a chair, do it in a way that's really solid and basically attach it to a bunch of different chairs in the same way then you can run around and run the same course, run over certain bumps and whatnot, and potentially have objective data that shows you right there. Hey, how does this one handle on a bump? You know, what, all, the, all the details basically right there in front of you laid out. So we're gonna play around with that a little bit. I've got this little thing here that I built up. When I'm filming stuff with my phone, this is what I use. It's got a little tripod thing on the bottom and sort of a ball head on the top. And then I attached this uh, Joby I think it's a grip tight phone mount. I always forget the name, but these things right here are really cool. And they hold your phone in a way that it will not come off. So what we're gonna do is attach this to this Yulonzi clamp. And of course, I'm gonna put Amazon associate links or whatever they're calling it now <laughs> down below so you guys can check out all this stuff. But basically, now we've got a little clamp here. We've got the phone mount. This slides up. Then we've got an old iPhone 7, I think. And we're basically just gonna clamp this in here. And now we have an adjustable mount for this phone that we can attach to the side of the chair. There's this little app, I think it's PyFox or PHYPHOX, but it basically allows you to access all of the sensors on the phone. So there's acceleration, gyroscope, all kinds of stuff. So I think what we're gonna do is play around with the gyroscope. And as you move this around on different axes, you can see that different sensors show different things. And I think this on the side of the chair will give us some objective data as to how bouncy things are. I, I need to figure out, we're gonna do some testing to see which orientation the phone is most sensitive in. Yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna try mounting it on the chair in a couple different methods and see which one gives us the most, gives us the most data. 
The overall idea though is going to be we'll take this setup and attach it to the side of the seat rail on a bunch of different chairs and we'll basically put it in exactly the same spot on each chair. I figure the seat pan's a good spot. Mounting it to the chair base may not give you, you know, actual ride quality data since the suspension on the seat well, basically the seat might move more or less than the power base does. So let's see here, how do we want to mount this thing? We want it to be as little extension as possible. So let's try it like this. And the idea with this rig is minimizing the amount of play that the holder has in it. So we're basically getting all of the shaking directly from the chair. Actually, let's center our phone up a little bit here because when you're testing things like this, the amount of motion that's in the rig that your test sensors are on can affect your results. But the idea is since everything's gonna be the same, we're gonna use the same rig, in theory, any variations will be the same between different chairs. Yeah, so that'll show, because a little bit of movement like this isn't a bad thing. So now that we have the G-Force modifying this, a little bit of movement's not bad, but if it's really sharp movement, it's gonna make larger movements on here. Okay, cool. I'm gonna run around outside and uh, see if the data is useful. Then we're gonna try rotating the phone this way, maybe laying it flat, and see which one gives us more information. Now I am noticing that our rig here is vibrating fairly substantially. So that could have an effect on things. If I'm not mistaken, I believe that this screen here shows the average of the entire run. And that was on the Stretto. So I think what we're gonna do, we're gonna mount it on the F3 over there and basically run the same route and then look at the numbers. I think I let this run a little bit too long here. Trying to get all this data to plot is a lot of calculations. So I think we need to basically tighten this up a little bit and not let it run for quite so long. So anyways, while that thing's tabulating, I'm gonna get this set up on the F3 and we're gonna run the same route again and see what the difference is. It's hard to find a spot outside that's not in the sun and also is not a billion degrees. Anyways, I realized I was using that data collection app a little bit incorrectly, which sort of invalidates the rest of the footage that I filmed. But the general concept is we can use smartphone sensors to quantify objective ride quality on different wheelchairs. And I'm playing around more with that in the background. It takes a lot of testing to try and figure out the best way to do it. And the mount I was using for the phone was rattling a little bit. I think I need to get a slightly different clamp mount because that C-clamp thing wasn't quite compatible with the three different chairs that I tested. So anyways, we're just gonna leave it there. That's the idea. And I'll be working on that in the background. Update on this here thing behind me, the blue van. It's gonna be like 650 some odd dollars to get the brakes done on it. I am on the schedule can't drive it until that gets done because, well, metal on metal is bad and at some point metal starts fusing and that's no good. The green van has been working. I've had to top off the coolant a couple of times. I'm just driving it real easy, not going above one third throttle. Um, the only other thing is this thing, technically it needs front struts and ball joints, which on these I think are one unit. So lower control arms and struts. Then also it's got 121,000 miles on it. The engine does make a bit of noise. Mm. Main thing though is the, I think it's the 41TE ultra drive transmission. These vans are kind of known for bad transmissions. Well, there's a bit of a misnomer with that. I'm not gonna go into it. They're, they, they're not always terrible, but they do not have an extremely long service life. We currently have 121,000 miles on this thing and in calling around to a few different transmission shops to see what an R&R replacement or a rebuild would be, everyone's like, 
wow, you're over 120,000 miles with a stock tranny? Um, <laughs> you're living on borrowed time. So, I think we're gonna replace the brakes. Well, I know we're gonna replace the brakes, but I think I'm gonna sell it. Um, to someone else that doesn't need to drive as much as I do, that thing could last for a while and be fine. Even when the transmissions start having problems, they can still last for a decent amount of time after that. It's just, I'm driving that thing for three to four hours, several days a week. So anyways, looking at some of the numbers here, the brakes, about 650 bucks on the back. Now that includes the calipers, the discs and the pads, and then also the shoes that go inside of the discs because they have an internal drum for the emergency brake. Um, front strut replacement, about $705. The ball joints on the front, just the parts are 440, and then it's 3.4 hours of labor, so that's another $442. So all that stuff totaled together, not factoring in the transmission, uh, about $2,237. But then if we assume the transmission is maybe gonna last, I don't think it'll last another 10,000 miles, I don't know, but if we factor that in, then we're at $5,737. And at that point, that's easily a different van. So, well, and then the engine stuff too. These engines are noisy. Only problem with this one is I'm hearing a bit of bottom end noise. And then there's a lot of valve train noise, which is intermittent. And then might be some wrist pins. So, I think this is the point where we just kind of cut bait or whatever and look at getting something different. I uh, I know I've been saying a lot. I would like to do the you know the whole FedEx van. I I got some photos of the actual size that I think would be perfect for using as a daily driver. It'd be easy to just stick one of the wheelchair lifts that I have in the warehouse in the back. Have a rear entry thing. Could even put it in an automatic door opener if we want to get fancy. But because the driver's console is so tall in those trucks or vans or whatever, it would be really trivial to put an easy lock on the ground and just pull right up to it, slam some hand controls in there and boom, you've got a thing with a ton of space in it, be a great road trip machine without much weight in there. You know, those diesel engines are gonna get better mileage than the green van does. This thing I'm getting maybe 16 or 17, biased mostly highway miles, so I don't know. At this point, I, Gas mileage is kind of a thing, but I need something that's big enough I can fit me and one other chair in easily and I can road trip back and forth because I'm not saying I'm leaving Oregon, but I do need to drive between here and other states to investigate some things. So anyways, um, yeah, things, I don't know. This blue van was just intended to be a stopgap anyways, and I've put probably 25,000 miles on it in the last year. So it served me well. You know, I've had to do brakes and a few other random little things here and there, but there's been no major catastrophic failures and you know, it's, it's done its job pretty well. So tomorrow we've got one of our weekly hikes and I'm gonna be taking the Amy Systems R3 on that because I wanna get some miles on that thing, get the, motors, uh, get the motors broken in, get the batteries cycled in and you know, really be able to form uh, some good opinions on that thing. I, I really wanna daily that chair if it's possible. Um, We'll talk about that more later, but uh, I really like the thing. I have it here with me, so I'm running around a, a little bit in it every day just to kind of get the battery cycled in. And then, of course, this lift is giving us some problems. Turns out, though, well, it's these gas struts right here. These things control the bridge plate, and apparently those are a wear item. As you can see here, the bridge plate is not retracting back where it should be which isn't the end of the world but the problem is that thing can get caught into this bar it can get caught on the side of the bus so really i just have to reach down and do that every time i want to take the thing back up but supposedly these parts are consumables i looked it up you have to buy both of the struts and the entire bridge plate assembly and all the hardware i really don't understand why everything has to be so expensive but that's like 800 some dollars for all that. I'm gonna see if there's another way around it maybe to use some automotive ones or something, but um, 
<laughs> if it's not one thing, it's many. So, I don't know. I mean, today is not like a huge bummer or anything. There's just, I don't know, the last few days, vans and wheelchair lifts and stuff. But, got a new chair, so that's cool. Tomorrow, going on a hike, gonna use the new chair for that. And then also there's some cool stuff we're gonna be modifying on it later on. Lots to ponder. Anyways, I think we're gonna call that good. So uh, thanks for watching, hopefully you enjoyed, and I will see you in the next video or live stream or whatever it happens to be.